First loss of the season for Arsenal, and it comes to AFC Bournemouth. Now, thoughts and prayers for the Bournemouth fans that will not hear the end of that red card for the next month. Yeah, let's talk about that red card. Actually, let's talk about the starting 11, right? Let's talk about the starting 11, because genuinely, I think that's the big... I think Arteta's team selection and his substitutions today for me are the biggest uh, talking point. Now... Arsenal go into this game. Odegaard has been out for like, I think it's up to two months now at this point. He's gone. Timber, he's missing as well too. Bukayo Saka, the symbol of consistency, the symbol of reliability, always ever present and always reliable when he's playing, misses the game today through injury. And I have to be honest with you, when I saw the lineup that Arteta put out, I wasn't surprised per se, but I have to say I was pretty underwhelmed. So they went for a, a midfield three. Of Partey, Declan Rice, Mikel Marino, and a front three of Trossard, Havertz, and Raheem Sterling. Now, look, I understand Arsenal are not going to go into games like the old Arsenal and try and play this 90 minutes of free-flowing, expansive, forget about the defensive side of the game football. I understand that they've evolved into a different kind of team. But still, you have to have some kind of creativity in, in, in your attack. You have to have some kind of, I don't know, match-winning ability from a certain individual or two. Some sort of like technical security. Some kind of guy that can unlock a defense. And I, I just found myself asking, yeah, if you can't give Ethan Wanneri minutes when Bukayo Saka and Martin Odegaard are out, I mean, when is this guy going to get minutes? And I hear it, right? He's still a youngster. He's still, what, 17 years old. You don't want to kind of throw him into the deep end. But but at the same time too, this is where you kind of see what your, your, your youngsters are made of. At some point, you got to try him out. And I think this was the perfect occasion. Saka's gone, or Saka's out. Odegaard's out. That's your whole right-hand side right there. And they carry so much of the attacking and creative and goal-scoring burden for Arsenal. Both of them are out. For me, this was the opportunity for Ethan Waneri to, to, to kind of start from the beginning. I thought so. Now, Arsenal fans might look at this and say, oh, we don't want to throw him into the deep end. Whatever. But... I have to be honest with you, chat. I think this was a massive, massive, massive opportunity that clearly wasn't achieved. And when you look at the way Arsenal started this game, right? We'll talk about the red card because I think that's the biggest talking point. That's where the game really changed. But even before the red card, chat, let, let, let's call it what it was. It was hardly some inspiring performance from Arsenal. Yes, they were defensively rigid. Yes, in midfield, they were compact. But it was, it was, it felt a little stale for me personally. And the red card is obviously what opens this game up entirely. William Saliba, was it a red card? Was it not? Uh, I mean, the initial on-field decision was a yellow card. And then upon further review of VAR, they decided that with the, with the, what's it called? How far away Ben White was. They saw David Raya kind of backpedaling. Saliba, they deemed was the last man. They gave it a red card. Me personally, I think it's a red card. Now I know what social media is going to be like. They're going to bring this instance when they didn't get a red card or this instance where the referee didn't give them a red card. Look, you can find instances for everything in terms of both decisions being given. But if we're just looking at was it the right call or not, just because those weren't awarded correctly doesn't mean that this one now all of a sudden we're going to award it incorrectly as well too. And I understand VAR and the officiating in this country is not perfect. But in this instance, I do think it's a red card. And now that's three red cards for Arsenal this season. And every single one of those games is where Arsenal have dropped points. They dropped points against Brighton when Declan Rice was sent off. They dropped points against Manchester City when Leandro Trossard was, was, was sent off. And now they've dropped points as well too against Bournemouth when William Saliba was sent off. Me personally, I think the Rice one was a little harsh. I think the Trossard one was deserved. And I think this one is the most clear cut. I, I think it was. And from that instance, Raheem Sterling is the one to kind of come off. And I'm not here to say again that Raheem Sterling was setting the world alight. But me personally, I think it was the incorrect decision. I think Trossard had to come off there. Because with Sterling, he is the most natural like dribbler and probably the most natural outlet out of himself, Havertz, and Leandro Trossard. Trossard is a shooter. Trossard in front of goal is cold-blooded. Great finisher, good both feet, headers. He's just a very good player in front of goal. But he's hardly someone who's going to really keep the ball. In fact, the red card really comes from a really straight pass from himself. He's not He's not really going to be dribbling players. He's not the type to like be on the last line. He's a finisher. He feeds off scraps. Havertz, I wouldn't have taken him off. Havertz, you need that guy that can hold up the ball. He's going to occupy the defense. But between Sterling and, and Trossard, I think I would have kept on Sterling, Chet. I have to be honest with you guys here. I would have kept on uh, Raheem Sterling. He comes off and on comes Jakob Kivior. And boy, I ain't even trying to make this like a whole I told you guys so. Because Kivior is not, well, he hardly covered himself in glory today, right? But he's not the story of this game. But a few people owe me an apology here, right? Because I called Kivior average a few, uh, uh, what was it? Was it beginning of the season or was it the end of last year? For me, Kivior is an average player, chat. I have to be honest with you guys. He's a useful squad player to have. 
no doubt about it. But there's a reason why I compared him to as a United fan when we used to have John O'Shea. He's a decent squad player to have. He can play uh, center back. He can play left back. Some people are convinced he can play as like an inverted fullback, play in midfield. But he's average. Realistically, he's average. Now that Calafiori is here, now that Timber is here, now you have Ben White, obviously. When Tomiyasu is fit, if he's ever fit, Kivior is behind all of those guys. I'm sorry, like he's he's nothing special. There's nothing special above Jakob Kivior. And I think he's going to be one of those guys, and you're seeing it, the more Arsenal evolve and the better players they kind of bring in, the recruitment increases and they, they bring in better players. Those kinds of players eventually drop farther and farther down the pecking order until they're eventually phased out. I hear it. Everybody wants to defend every player on their team, especially when you're in a good moment and you're winning games. But please do not try and gaslight me about players that are not worth gaslighting. Jakob Kivior is a standard Premier League player. There has never been anything special about the guy. And today, boy, 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 boy. I mean, let's talk about the penalty, right? Kivior sloppy from him. Evan Nilsson gets on the ball. And Evan Nilsson for me, right? He's got a, he, I mean, he's basically, his fingerprints are all over this game. He's the one that get the basically gets William Saliba sent off. He's the one that gets the penalty off David Raya. But he's extremely, he's extremely raw. Evan Nelson. I said that when I saw him last season for Porto, and I'm saying it again this year as well, too. Evan Nelson has a little bit about him. He's very, very aggressive. He's very, very direct, but he's extremely raw. He's extremely raw. Uh, and I actually think the penalty, it is a penalty, but I think Raya Fs up there. Like, Evan Nelson, I thought, took that so, so poorly. His decision to try and round Raya, I don't even think he did a great job of of rounding Raya. I think Raya should have done much better in that situation because I don't think Evan Nelson made it a case of like, oh, Raya had to take him down there. I think he was kind of, he was kind of suspect in the way he kind of took that opportunity. But David Raya, who has been so, so good this season, I don't think, I don't think he had a great game today, David Raya. I think his kicking today was all, it was not as reliable as it usually is. Um, I think for the penalty, me personally, I don't think Raya covered himself in full glory in terms of how he took down Evan Nelson. I just like, Maybe I have to see it a few more times, but I think Raya didn't have to take him down there. I think he could have actually stopped the situation. But so it goes, Cloyvert takes the penalty, buries it past Raya, and from there on, on, like Bournemouth were never going to give up a 2-0 lead. And Arsenal had a few chances here and there, so did Bournemouth. Bournemouth could have scored a few goals today, right? Once Arsenal went down to 10 men, it really became a case of can they keep Bournemouth out? If not, when are Bournemouth going to score? But Arsenal, give them credit, they had one chance, right? For like one clear, clear chance that Martinelli will be kicking himself tonight about because he absolutely had to finish that one. He absolutely had to finish that one. But he doesn't. And that kind of sums up his season per se. Like he's had good moments. He's had moments similar to last season of Martinelli. Not clinical, not reliable like a Bukayo Saka is. And I think it's a deserved loss. Look, the red card obviously has a huge uh, part to play in this. And I know people are going to be kind of going back and forth. Was he the last man? Would Ben White have recovered? I think it's a red card. And I think... A Bournemouth win is the least that they deserved. I think they were the better team. And I think even before the red card, I think Bournemouth were very, very impressive. And I look at Bournemouth, right? First of all, Iraola is becoming, in my opinion, one of the more slept on managers in the league in terms of how he has Bournemouth playing, where they were before he got there under Gary O'Neill. By the way, a very, very compact unit, very difficult to beat. But the evolution from Gary O'Neill's team to now Iraola's team, who can actually go head to head, compete with all of the big boys in the league since Iraola has come in. He's had big results against some of the big teams. This is just the latest of them. But I think Iraola is, in my opinion, a really, really decent manager. Honestly. For me, it's a similar one to Thomas Frank where they manage smaller teams. So they're not really at the forefront of people's minds when we talk about big jobs and could they take over a bigger job. But I ask, why not? Why not, man? I, I saw Deserbi go from Brighton to now he's managing Marseille. I saw company managing Burnley and now he's managing Bayern Munich. Why can't the likes of Thomas Frank and Andoni Iraola go on to, to, to manage or aspire to manage bigger clubs? I, I don't really see why not. I look at Bournemouth too as well too. This is their third win of the season. I'm actually shocked about that. I am shocked by that. And when I looked at the results, there's a few of them here and there that I'm thinking, mm, you guys got unlucky there. Like against Chelsea, they missed the penalty. And then I think it was Nkunku scores in basically like the last few minutes. That's an unlucky one right there. Uh, I think even against Liverpool, they played okay. They got beat by, by, by three great goals. I, I think Bournemouth are a better team than where are they right now in League 10th. I think, I think they could realistically hope to finish in the top half. Uh, very impressive. I think Semenyo for me is somebody that every single time I watch him, I grow more and more and more um, impressed by. I think he's a really, really exciting player. I think Otara, when he comes on, good player. Christie, I had I thought had a really good impact off the bench today. Like I said as well, too, they, they get, Evan Nilsson, for me, if they can kind of give him time and he can kind of put it all together like his physical and technical skill set 
says he should be able to, I think he could be a handful for a lot of defense. I think Bournemouth for now, they've they've solidified themselves in my opinion as like a Premier League mainstay and genuinely, I think they could finish in the top 10 this year. I, I wouldn't be surprised. Now let us talk about Arsenal. How big of a blow is this for them? It is a big blow, right? Because when you're competing against Manchester City and you're competing against Liverpool, which they are for the league title, every single point and every single defeat and every single win matters. The margin for error in these in the Premier League these days is so, so small. And especially when you look at the next few fixtures that Arsenal have, right? Next game's against Liverpool. Who have, let's, let's face it, Liverpool have their own tough fixtures to kind of deal with. But if I look up... Let's look up Arsenal's fixtures. They got Liverpool next. Liverpool at home is always a difficult one. Newcastle away, I don't care what anybody tells me. Newcastle away is a, is a tough game for most Premier League teams, especially the big teams. Newcastle tend to, to love an upset, even though I don't think Newcastle have been that great. Chelsea away is next too. So you look at these next three fixtures. These are tough fixtures, man. Like, look, Arsenal will go into all of them thinking, yeah, we should we can win these, this game. We're, we're a great team. But these are tough fixtures. And that's why these games away to Bournemouth, they are potential banana peels. I get that. But you got to get those points on the board because this is really where you would have hoped okay, if we draw to Liverpool or we draw away to Chelsea, we can afford to do that because we got the three points against Bournemouth. So I think this is a really difficult one, right? However, the biggest talking point, excuse me, is how vulnerable are Arsenal when Bukayo Saka and Martin Odegaard aren't on the pitch? This is really where the depth might come to be an issue. And this is where, again, I looked at Arsenal's transfer window and I was a little underwhelmed by it, right? Like already, I don't think Arsenal are blessed with what I call X-Factor players, players that can grab games by the scruff of the neck and create moments out of nothing. And you guys know, I've said this spiel a thousand times, but the ones that they do have, two of them are without a doubt, Bukayo Saka and Odegaard. I think you need more to compete on all fronts. I genuinely do it. Definitely in the Champions League, but in the league as well too. You look at how many players Manchester City, I know Manchester City are, are a completely different case. Like, Financially, they're just on a, in a different stratosphere. But even Liverpool, they have players that can kind of get you out of moments. And I think Arsenal now, the last two games, have really showed that when Bukayo Saka and Martin Odegaard aren't there, how are they going to break down opposition? How are they going to completely box in teams and create chance after chance after chance? We know Arsenal defensively, I've said it a million times, I think they're the best defensive team in the world. But offensively, I think those issues already exist in terms of X factor and match winners even when everyone is fit. And now when you take off their two biggest ones in Odegaard and Saka, boy, like I said, you're going to have to find some solutions. Or I think by the end of the season, if Arsenal don't win the league again, you could be looking at these games where Saka and Odegaard don't kind of aren't available and, and think, hmm, in the summer, could they have done a little more? Arteta said we were light in the summer and did nothing about it. A absolutely. Absolutely. And look, the loan signing of Sterling was always going to be a bargain. I always thought it was a bargain worth taking if you're Arsenal and you already have a really set squad. And look, Sterling is on loan. Most of his wages are being paid by Chelsea. It's it's a, a loan worth taking. It's low risk, high reward. Um, but A, I don't think his start at Arsenal has been anything to, to, to write home about. Granted, he hasn't started many games. Games like today, it's kind of out of his control when there's a red card. He doesn't really get the chance to show what he can do. But if we're being absolutely objective here, it hasn't been a great start to life at Arsenal for Raheem Sterling. For me, it's been, it's been quite underwhelming. And this is, again, like I understand the caliber of player that I'm talking about, they cost a lot of money. You're not going to get the kind of player I'm talking about for 30 million, or you're not going to get him on loan. But to bridge the gap with the best teams in Europe, which Arsenal have done a very good job at doing season after season after season. But for me, to take the next step, to get over the line in these big competitions, I do think they need a lot more bona fide world-class talent when it comes to their attack. I, I think they have some players that are absolutely of that caliber. Saka is without a doubt one of the best players in this position. Odegaard. I think they've done really well, actually, to kind of make sure his absence hasn't been felt that much. But come on, man, you need a bit more than this. And I think today will be a, a, a damning indication of that. Ethan Waneri, like I said, I'm not saying Waneri is the next CML, but also here's the thing. We'll never know if you don't play him. If, if you're just going to give him the last 10 minutes, we're never going to know what Nwaneri can do. The difference is when City have their best players injured, they still win. Arsenal could only win luckily without Saka and Odegaard. I don't think they've been lucky when Odegaard has been out. I think Arsenal have shown a real new element to them in the last few weeks since Odegaard has been out. You've seen Saka really kind of take over the responsibility as the chief creator as well as being the chief goal scorer. I think Saka has flourished, in fact, uh, in Ode Odegaard's absence. Not saying it's because of Odegaard, but I think he's taken on that responsibility. Arsenal have almost played as like a 4-4-2. They've been okay. But without both of them, boy, 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 you're relying on, on for me, an over-the-hill Sterling. You're relying on Trossard. You're relying on Martinelli. Like, come on, man. That That's not a, an attack that screams to me. If you have to play with them long-term, Arsenal are not winning the league if that's your attack. That's the harsh reality. When you look at a City, and like I said, City, it's hard to compare anyone to them. I'm not trying to say, oh, 
City can do it. Why can't Arsenal? Because I get City have depth. They spend more. They got they got more in reserve. But you look at last season. How many? How much time did De Bruyne miss? How many games did Haaland miss? It's just next man up. And I don't think Arsenal have that luxury because I think, truthfully, their recruitment team let them down this summer. The likes of Calafiori, good signing. Marino, I thought he was okay today. I had nothing really to write home about. Sterling, we'll see how that kind of pans out. But I do think it was an underwhelming, an underwhelming window. I even look at Liverpool, right? Like, they got six options up front there, bro. In Diaz, Nunez, Jota, Salah, Gakpo, Chiesa even now. You got a luxury of attacking options. And you might say, well, are any of those guys better than Trossard? Are any of those guys better than Martinelli? I think they're different. I think they're versatile. I think they can, a, a lot of those guys that I just named, can kind of create moments out of nothing. They are capable of, of being match winners. Whereas Arsenal, I think, Barsak and Odegaard, the other guys that I'm talking about, they're good cogs to the machine. But as great a machine as you are, you still need those guys that you can get the ball and they can win you games. But anyways, is it the end of the world for Arsenal? Um, I wouldn't say so, per se. If I look at the table right now, they're Arsenal, one point behind Liverpool, 17, but with a game in hand. Liverpool obviously hosts Chelsea tomorrow. Manchester City, they play tomorrow as well, too, against... Who do Manchester City play against today? Or tomorrow? Wolves. Wolves away. You'd have to, you'd have to assume City take care of business there, bro. It's a hard one to take, man. I'll be real. It's a hard one to take if you're an Arsenal fan. But... Long season, got to just now win those next three games. Liverpool at home, Newcastle away, Chelsea away. I think Arsenal can get, if they can go three for three in those games, then they can afford to put a result back uh, kind of in the back of their minds. But damn, that's a, that's a tough one. That's a, that's a really tough one to stomach, man. Let me know what Arsenal fans are thinking in here, man. Injuries ruined us today, but poor form, poor from Arteta, bad substitutes. I agree. I do. I do agree, man. I do agree. I didn't. I, for me, look, I get the red card is the big one, but I think still you can manage a game better than Arteta did today. Saliba suspended versus Liverpool too. Now, is Saliba suspended for the next three games or is it just the Liverpool game? And how do Arsenal line up now against, um, against what's it called? Liverpool. Does Calafiori play? No, you, you're not playing two left footed center backs. Does Ben White maybe play at center back? You hope Timber is back. Uh, are you starting Kivior? I don't know. How's Arsenal lining up against Liverpool now? Calafiori center back. Calafiori and Gabriel at center back. Two left footed center backs. I feel like that's kind of taboo. <laughs> I feel like that's kind of taboo. It's one of those unwritten rules in football. Timber right back, white center back. That one I see a lot more. I could I could definitely see that happening. Sterling for Kivior is crazy. I just want to know why when we face adversity, Arteta goes into a shell. Why don't we trust Kala, Gabriel, and White? Even drop Rice and keep Sterling on for an option to at least have some sort of attacking threat. I think, look, Arteta, I think, is a top-level manager. I think he's one of the best managers in the world. But let's be real. Arteta is a pragmatist, man. Arteta is a pragmatist. And there's no problem with that, right? Some of the biggest winners in football are pragmatic. But I do think Arteta is a very pragmatic manager. Like, for me, his main focus when it comes to, to winning football games is, first of all, make sure we're defensively resolute. And then let's break down the opposition. That's, I don't think it's a bad thing, by the way, but that's his style. However, I do think there are times where Arteta is too, I don't want to say negative, right? But I, I don't know. I think today, personally, he went too defensive. Like for me, he went way too defensive. Taking off Sterling, the minute you go down to 10 men, basically eliminating any transition threat you're going to have. And you're just really hoping to win the game at that point off set pieces, just defend and win off set pieces. Let's be real, chat. That's a negative, that's a, that's a, that's a, um, that's a tactic that you would expect from a, like a mid-level club. I do think Arsenal, like if you were to see Liverpool or City or, yeah, I would say those are the main two. If they go down to 10 men, I don't think they're going as defensive as, as Arsenal did today. I don't think they would. Yeah, I don't, I don't think Pep, for example, completely relinquishes control of the, of, of the ball the minute he goes down to 10 men. I do think Arteta is more prone to do that. Like Arteta for me, if even before today, I would have expected him to do that. That lack of trust is worrying. It is. And um, that's something I said last season, right? There was a big conversation I wanted to have last year when we were talking about like the lack of X factor in Arsenal's attackers, because there were some Arsenal fans that were suggesting, is it the fact that they're not able to do it? Or is it the fact that they're maybe like restricted due to Arteta? Like, are there moments where Saka isn't given as much freedom as he would have under a different manager because of the way Arteta manages football games? And I can hear it at times too. But also, I think it's something you have or you don't. But I definitely agree. Arteta definitely does not allow like free reign the same way a Pep does or, or, a, or a, in the past a club does or maybe even a slot does now. Bit of both. It's both. Yeah, yeah, it could potentially be both. Right? It doesn't have to be one or the other. Can Arsenal beat Liverpool without Saliba? Yeah, I, I think they could. I mean, obviously now it's going to be a lot more difficult. It will be a lot more difficult. 